The late 90s to early 2000s were interesting times for the internet and the companies that came along with it. The internet in the 90s was still very new and there were pretty much no established internet companies until the late 90s. People were just beginning to realize the potential of the internet and were trying to figure out how to transfer traditional business to the online world. It was, however, rapidly growing. In 1990, only around 15% of US households owned a computer, and by 2000, that number had reached 50%, with 41% of households having internet access. We all know that computers and the internet were revolutionary, but at the time, it was completely new territory for everyone, including businesses. Thousands of companies were being created to see if it was possible to take advantage of the hype surrounding this new technology, and it turned out, it was, and it was almost too easy. The unbelievable growth rates of the internet and the future potential of it caused investors to give out unbelievable amounts of money to fund these companies. Investors were giving millions to almost any internet company, even if they didn't have proof of any revenues or if they even had working technology. Just having something as simple as a prefix such as E, I, or net were factors considered by investors. It was a completely new market fueled by hype and excitement which was thought to be backed by the extremely high growth rates the internet allowed for. Internet companies could bring in users and potential revenues that were unheard of for any traditional company, leading to high valuations and wild speculation. Companies experienced record-breaking IPOs, ridiculous early-stage funding, and huge mergers and acquisitions with little to back any of it. This made some people millionaires and even billionaires overnight, but a lot of money was also lost. One of the dot-com era companies that demonstrated this was a video streaming site called Pixelon. Founded in 1998 by Michael Fenn, Pixelon promised to provide high-quality video to their site through uploaded content by the company, as well as live coverage of events. Similar to what YouTube is today, but Pixelon would be providing the content. Pixelon had received $35 million of financing even though they didn't have proof of any revenues or that their software was even capable of doing what they said it could. Fenn told investors their plans of creating a 1,000 channel internet broadcasting site that could compete with CBS and Disney without a plan on how to achieve it, and that's all it took for investors to get on board with him. With the funding, Fenn hosted a $16 million launch party called iBash99, with the intent to show off the company's software and ability to stream high quality video to thousands of people. This was supposed to be the company's first content offering which somehow justified spending nearly half of the company's capital on a party. The party was hosted at the MGM Grand Las Vegas and some of the performances that were booked included The Who, Kiss, The Dixie Chicks, and Tony Bennett. The people at home that attempted to watch it online were let down when error messages kept popping up. The stream was essentially unwatchable for the average internet user and Pixelon couldn't even keep the content on their site because the music artists demanded their performances be taken down. It was clear that the technology didn't work and the $16 million had essentially gone to nothing. The following months weren't good for Pixelon. Pixelon's founder and chairman Michael Fenn was fired and it was later found out that he was not actually who he said he was. Michael Fenn was instead David Stanley, who was a fugitive who had been on the run since 1996. He was sentenced to 36 years in prison for fraud-related charges, but instead of going to prison, he decided to run off and start a tech company. And he progressed fairly quickly with it too. Him and the other founders of his first company, Digital Motion Video, had successfully created software that allowed video to be played full screen at 30 FPS, making it look just like televisions at the time. They didn't have a way to stream it to millions of people though, like they had hoped. Stanley didn't actually do any of the technical work, and people he worked with reported that he lied to customers, investors, and associates about his skills, and the potentials of his companies. When he was starting Pixelon, he made extremely unrealistic promises that the technology at the time could not support, and was not even close to being able to. Stanley was fired after the iBash disaster, and he turned himself in shortly after that. Pixelon fired employees and reduced its operations to try to save the company, but they eventually had a file for bankruptcy in 2000. But either way, Stanley's charming personality tricked investors and companies to invest millions into him and his ideas. It just goes to show how easy it was to make money during this time and someone could just fake their way to success. Another hyped up company was Commerce One. Founded in 1994, Commerce One created software that provided an online marketplace for businesses to trade with each other and their suppliers. Traditional buying and selling of small but necessary supplies such as paperclips now had an automated system with standard procedures saving a lot of time and money for companies in any industry. This type of business-to-business e-commerce gained a lot of popularity at the time and investors were quick to throw a lot of money at the companies creating it. Companies such as Boeing, General Motors, Chrysler, and Wells Fargo bought the software, as well as hundreds of other companies, and the future was looking very promising for Commerce One. 
Commerce One went public on July 1st, 1999, and by the end of the year, the stock price had risen by 2,700%. By March 9th, 2000, it peaked, hitting a $21.5 billion market cap. Even though Commerce One did have the technology and the sales to justify some of its value, most of it was driven by investor hysteria and no one, not even Commerce One, really knew how to operate and scale in this new industry. They did have money though, and a lot of it. Shareholders and employees who took stock options became millionaires overnight, and the company had the funds to do pretty much anything. There aren't any reports of them doing anything as crazy as Pixelon, but they did go through millions trying out new projects without much of an idea of what they were doing. Commerce One partnered with a company called SAP to create the ultimate e-commerce software, tying up all of its resources in hopes that the demand for the software would last. In 2001, however, most companies reduced their technology spending, and the e-marketplace software was no longer in demand. Commerce One had to change their focus and work on something new, but all of its resources were tied up in the SAP partnership. The slowing economy, a list of management issues, and new competitors coming in caused Commerce One to file for bankruptcy in 2004. Investors and employees did make a lot of money though if they cashed out early while the company's value was inflated by billions. One of the more popular cases is Broadcast.com, founded in 1989 by Christopher Jabe who later brought on board the now Mavericks owner Mark Cuban in 1994. Broadcast.com was a site that allowed people to listen to sports games online. At the time, this wasn't as hard of a task as high quality video streaming and it also had a lot of demand. They were able to get a working product released and on its IPO in 1998, the stock price immediately rose by 250% on the first day. The company was worth $1 billion at the time and the founders immediately had individual fortunes in the hundreds of millions. Just nine months after the IPO on April Fool's Day 1999, Yahoo announced the acquisition of the company for $5.7 billion worth of Yahoo's extremely high valued stock at the time, turning the founders from millionaires into billionaires overnight. Yahoo was essentially paying $10,000 per monthly user, which was insane for a company offering something for free. It wasn't even expected to make a profit until years down the road, and they were planning on losing more money each year until then. At the time of the acquisition, Yahoo was declining in sales, so this was an attempt to stay ahead of the competition and gain some extra users. Broadcast.com had 570,000 users at the time of the acquisition, which was a decent amount but not worth $5.7 billion. And just three years later, Yahoo ended up shutting down the site. Cuban received $1.7 billion of stock, and even Todd Wagner, who only owned 1% of the company, received over $50 million worth of stock from the acquisition. Somebody has got to be the luckiest person in the world. Somebody's got to be, right? <laughs> it's you. And I'm just glad it's me. <laughs> this is known as one of the worst dot-com deals, but Yahoo is still around today, and the founders of Broadcast are extremely wealthy. So no one really lost, just Yahoo in the short term. In 2000, several companies placed huge sell orders on their stocks which caused investors to panic, triggering them to sell their own stocks. The stock market dropped 10% in just a few weeks and combined with other factors over the course of two years, a total of $5 trillion worth of value was gone. People finally realized that these internet companies were not worth their valuations and only around 50% of the companies survived. But a lot of people made a lot of money along the way. Overnight millionaires and billionaires were created and some of the companies are still around today and thriving. Thanks for watching and let me know if you have any suggestions for future videos. Take care.